Thank you, ma'am. That was a little more than generous. Sananavati, my good friend Ajay, distinguished guests from overseas, ladies and gentlemen. I was just telling Ajay that I'm here speaking at your conference, whereas Mr. Arun Jetli, the finance minister, is replying to the debate on the motion of thanks to the president's address. But then I think Ajay can help me save the day with the finance minister afterwards if I need his help. <laughs> it's very interesting that uh, energy has taken center stage in the national discourse. And even an organization which, when I first read and heard about it, I was surprised, why should you be talking about uh, energy or about renewable energy or taking this subject so seriously and having a whole uh, dialogue around different aspects of the energy chain when most of the participants deal with the chemical industry, if I'm not mistaken, chemical and petrochemical. But it's, uh, it's a matter of uh, satisfaction that today the entire nation has recognized that power or electricity and then along with that all other forms of energy will be the most critical ingredient, will be the fulcrum of India's growth and development in the years to come. And if at all India has to plan for double-digit growth, not for one year, two years, but for several decades going forward, and meet the aspirations of the people of India. I think sufficient, quality, affordable, 24 by 7 energy access is going to be one of the most critical ingredients, requirements to make this dream of a prosperous India, self-reliant, developed India possible. And I'm glad that uh, Argus Elite Plus has chosen to spend two whole days discussing various forms of energy and its impact on India's energy security, India's self-reliance, India's development, India's competitiveness in the Committee of Nations. And in some sense, I think the very fact that Prime Minister Modi decided to bring these three ministries under one umbrella reflects the importance that he gives to this sector also. For me, this journey has been a journey full of learnings, some, a subject which I knew nothing about till 26th of May last uh, 2014, but a subject which is extremely engrossing and has huge potential. In fact, uh, as I see the days going forward, this one sector alone has the possibilities of building up an investment potential of a trillion dollars in the next 15 years. More immediate future, I see a $250 billion investment only in these three sectors of power, coal, and renewable energy. Of course, we have Sudhir here and the oil and gas sector would have another huge investment potential and dimension, undoubtedly. But if you look at electricity, and uh, this is my third speaking engagement of the day, and I have two more to go before I wind up. But uh, my focus in both my earlier engagements also today and the last one was very, very interesting. It was at the National Defense College, which has 100 participants coming from not only all over India but, and all the different services, but from several countries around the world, some 22 countries, engaging in a development program where they are discussing various aspects of national security. And energy was one of the subjects under discussion. And today, when I was highlighting small interventions, Madam, you alluded to the LED bulbs program. I'll just correct the perspective. 
the LED bulbs program is our effort to replace all the lighting load of the country, both <coughs> domestic and offices and factories on the street lights with LEDs, such that the country will save nearly 110 billion units of electricity every year. 110 billion units means a saving of about a six, six and a half billion dollars in consumer bills and not saving by giving a subsidy or giving some government intervention. It's truly reduction in your electricity bills with your own efforts, by your own taking a pain to replace a bulb with an LED bulb. And just this one program will result in a avoided peak capacity, installed capacity. So we won't need 22,000 megawatt of electricity capa generating capacity for peak hours with a corresponding reduction in carbon dioxide emissions of 80 million tons every year. Just one program. And typically how such programs were run in this country were you do a pilot, you assess the results of that pilot, then plan a scale-up, have extensive discussions, files move around in different corridors and different ministries, and one doesn't know when the program will see the end of day. In fact, on a lighter note, we have railway lines which started implementation in 1975 and to date remain incomplete. Forget incomplete, they're not even 50% complete. Started 40 years ago. But the government's intention is to move the needle to speed, skill and scale. You scale up your program, do it in a most efficient and effective manner very fast and implement it skillfully. And a, and a saving of a six and a half billion dollars, I'm sure ladies and gentlemen, you'll all agree, is something the country cannot afford to lose even one day on. And we got down to the task from a sale of 600,000 bulbs by the government company which runs this program in the year 2013-14, barely two years ago. The company, it's a government company, it sold 600,000 bulbs in a year. In the current year, we are already at 75 million in 11 months and we'll end the year by 90 million. So a scale up from 600,000 to 90 million in a span of two years. And by 2019, India will be 100% LED, giving us all these benefits. Now that is the impact that well-run, well-oiled programs, planned well, executed to precision, can have on the economy of the country. Obviously, you will all appreciate that with economies of scale and a very transparent procurement process, we've also been able to bring down the prices by about 80%, from 310 rupees to 64 rupees per bulb that the government procures. So all of this, ladies and gentlemen, is possible. And all of this lends itself to huge technological challenges, it provides opportunities to the Make in India program. It helps Digital India support our energy efficiency mechanisms. After all, LEDs, when we replace all the street lights with LEDs, they have the automatic capabilities of switch on, switch off through uh, mobile uh, systems. You can dim the lights as the day progresses. You can expand the illumination as the evening progresses. Thereby, all of these things help us save energy and make the entire program self-financing. We don't need to spend a single rupee and we are not giving one rupee of subsidy to make this program happen. But that's the strength of technology. That's the strength of scale. And that's the strength of honesty in running the program. Similarly, on railways, about a month ago, or not even a month ago, probably 20 days ago, 
the railway minister was sitting at an interaction with the president of the Bharatiya Janata Party, Mr. Amit Shah. And Mr. Shah told him that it's high time India becomes self-sufficient and self-reliant in oil and gas. And we need to give a big thrust both to exploration of domestic oil and gas sources and to avoiding consumption of oil and gas wherever we can. It's a two-pronged attack which will ultimately lead to our own independence, energy independence. While uh, you are all aware that the budget has made significant uh, announcements in terms of further support to expanding the exploration of oil and gas both the reserves and the actual output being encouraged. And this government is committed to ensuring expanded output of both oil and gas. We are also applying our mind what to do to avoid the consumption. And Mr. Amit Shah gave an idea which the railway minister then called me. And just to give you a reflection of how decisions are taken and how impactful programs can be expedited even within the framework of a government so that that could be some food for thought for your panel after I go. But when Minister Suresh Prabhu called me, by coincidence I had the team, my power team sitting in my room, the power secretary was there, the people who are running the LED program were there. So I said, Suresh ji, let, let me put you on speaker phone so that this conversation can be converted into a meeting and let's record whatever we are discussing. So he came on speaker phone and he said, I am consuming over 2 billion litres of diesel for running diesel locomotives in the railways. About half the railway network still does not have electrification, 35,000 kilometres of rail lines. If all of that was to be converted to electric lines, India would not only save that 2 billion litres of imports, which is precious foreign exchange, but the railway's energy bill could come down from as high as 16,000 crores to about 3,500 crores for the electricity that would be required to replace that uh, diesel consumption. Now that was the delta of saving. And I said, okay, done. Instead of the 1,000 or 1,500 kilometers that you do every year of electrification, let's plan to do it in three years or three and a half years. And let's plan to take up the entire project at one go, which can help us get economies of scale. Because after all, doing 1,000, 1,500 kilometers or 10,000 kilometers every year, should not be very much different, particularly when land is in our possession. The rail tracks are all there. We just have to set up transmission line. Last year, <coughs> power grid alone added 22,000 kilometers, circuit kilometers of transmission. This year, we are going to close at about 27, 28,000 circuit kilometers of transmission lines being added. So it should not be that big a challenge for us to replace that. And I'm sure, and I've not done any study, but I'm sure if we were to do this whole project in three years, we could bring down the cost to half. And then the savings itself would pay for the entire project. Railways need not add any freight surcharge, need not add any cost, and can get the whole system electrified, free of charge. So I've offered that the power ministry and my PSUs will invest the entire money to electrify in three and a half years. Whatever you save, will share. You keep 75%, or rather you keep 25%, I keep 25%, and 50% goes towards paying off the loans and the investment. And it's a win-win for everybody. The railways, my companies make, get good business and make good money. The investment cycle gets kick-started on a fast-track basis. Country saves precious foreign exchange, recurring saving for years and years to come. We bring down the pollution because you're all aware those diesel locomotives spew out a lot of environmental pollution. And as we are moving towards the world's largest renewable energy program 
adding 175 or rather reaching the goal of 175 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2022 something this government is deeply committed to we could possibly have a day where the entire Indian railways would be green the world's largest green railway in fact Kochi airport is not only India's but the world's first 100% green airport I had some uh, journalist from National Geographic in town last week I went and showed him the large solar installations at the Delhi airport which is now generating huge amounts of electricity and they have plans in the next one and a half year to become completely green of course they'll be banking some of the power they generate and using it for the night night hours just like Kochi does but it's the thought behind it it's the effort behind it it's the thinking behind this program. And to my mind, your industry, the chemical and petrochemical industry, can support these initiatives with a lot more in terms of research. Take ethanol, for example. Ethanol, I don't know if it comes within the purview of the chemical industry at all, but it's a powerful biofuel which can replace the consumption of petrol and diesel significantly. I'm sure additives that I, I often get these requests that we have some additive which can bring down the coal consumption or the auxiliary water consumption or reduce the steam requirement. All of these, I'm not a technical person, so kindly pardon my ignorance. But there's so much that your industry can do to help us cut down on carbon emissions, to help us cut down on energy requirements, help us reduce the waste that is generated in the thermal power plants, the SOX and NOx levels. Lots of immense possibilities. If we can introduce world-class technologies in India, if we can bring the best of brains, research, innovation into India, both indigenously developed patents and technology or sourced from international experts, in fact, R&D has been given a big thrust in this budget where Indian developed R&D and Indian registered patents would be encouraged and tax of only 10% will be charged on the world profits of Indian indigenous <coughs> patents or developed technologies. So there's huge potential, huge, immense scope to work in partnership, to work together as a team to bring the benefits of innovation to the people of India, to see how we can, in your own spheres, use more and more energy efficient uh, technologies, equipment. After all, all petrochemical plants are huge guzzlers of steam and electricity. All the chemical plants across the country are hugely polluting the water table and bringing out a lot of effluents which, which several times are not even treated. I ran an industry several years ago in Thana. If any of you are familiar with the Thana Bilapur industrial belt, where more than 20 years ago, not even 20, maybe 30 years ago, we had set up a common effluent treatment plant. And I tell you, it was a brilliant profit-making venture. So the, the industry association, Thana Belapur Industry Association, got together in a cooperative venture. Everybody pooled resources. We set up a common effluent treatment plant. Everybody benefited from disposing of the effluents through that plant. Pipelines were laid, taking the effluent straight into the uh, common effluent treatment plant. And the last balance sheet that I saw now about 15 years ago, showed huge results and huge profits of that company. I don't see any reason why we can't duplicate it in the rest of the country. Why should even one liter of effluent be thrown into the sea or into the rivers or even into the ground, which is not treated? And to my mind, this is something which all of us should take upon ourselves as a duty, as our responsibility. We are in a small, humble measure made it mandatory for power plants 
to consume water, treated water, out of municipal waste water, so that municipalities and citizens can get the clean water which would otherwise be used in power plants. And treated water is used in generation of electricity, compulsory. So these are small interventions that we could do on our end. But I would urge all of you from this industry, in your own processes, please see how you can make them more energy efficient. Every unit of energy saved, in a way, equals a unit and 1.33 units of electricity in terms of its generation, considering all the losses in the system. So I would urge all of you, energy is a vital element in the economic landscape of this country. It's an element which will define India's competitive edge in the years to come. It's going to be an essential feature to promote industry to come to India. After all, nobody is going to go and invest in a country if it doesn't su offer sufficient electricity. Even though it may have a billion people, a market of a billion people, but industry will need electricity to run. And what we are trying to do is make India energy surplus. In some small measure, we have been successful. Today, the country generates more power than it can consume. We can provide electricity to the nook and corner of the country. Of course, our immediate focus is on affordability of power and on taking power to the 18,452 villages where young boys and girls are still deprived of a basic amenity like power, something which I consider a matter of shame for all of us, including me, that it did, took this country seven decades to take power to all our citizens. But be that as it may, we have taken it up on mission mode. I'll seek your cooperation, I'll seek your participation, and I'll seek your encouragement to be able to succeed in this mission, which will, be, which will remain incomplete without your support in our efforts to save electricity, without your support in our effort to protect the environment, please join us in this mission. A clean India, a green India, a self-sufficient, self-reliant India, an India where all our businesses can prosper with electricity available round the clock, 24 by 7, at affordable prices, where our competitiveness can take us through the frontiers of international trade and make us a superpower that we all believe this country is truly destined to be. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, what an address. Now we know, sir, that what is...